All right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to um, the Department of Defense History Speaker Series. My name is Joseph Arena. I am the OSD Historical Office. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is being recorded and um, posted online. So if you could please remove. Brief note, uh, we will have time for questions at the end of the talk. And uh, please, uh, the usual disclaimer that any opinions shared by our speaker are his own and do not represent the official positions of the OSD Historical Office or the Department. So one of the goals of this speaker series is to connect scholars with practitioners in DOD. So it's always a treat to introduce a speaker who has earned distinction in both his scholarship and in his practice. Colonel Kevin Benson served for three decades in the United States Army. He was the Director of Plans for 3rd U.S. Army and the Combined Forces Land Component Command at the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom from July 2002 to July 2003. He previously commanded 3rd Battalion, 8th Cavalry between 1998 and 2000. After leaving Iraq, he taught at the Red Team School and became director of the School of Advanced Military Studies. In October 2010, he returned to Baghdad to help plan the successful conclusion of U.S. operations in Iraq. Recently, he has supported war games and participated in seminars on military thought and planning. Among his decorations, Kevin earned the Distinguished Service Medal, Legion of Merit, and the Bronze Star. Kevin graduated from West Point in 1977 and completed the U.S. Army Officer Basic Course. He continued his military education at the U.S. Marine Corps Amphibious Warfare School, the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, and the School of Advanced Military Studies. He earned a Ph.D. in American History from the University of Kansas in 2010. And in 2020, he served as an adjunct scholar at the U.S. Military Academy's Modern War Institute. Kevin has written for many publications, including Parameters, Military Review, Army Magazine, Time, Politico, Infantry Journal, Strategy Bridge, and War on the Rocks. Today's talk is based on his book, Expectation of Valor, about his experiences as the Third Army J-5 at the opening of the Iraq War, and it was released today, July 18th, 2024, through Casemate Publishing. So let us give a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Kevin Benson. Now, usually when I talk, I like to walk around because moving targets are harder to hit. Uh, but thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you all for spending some time here. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to try to live up to that introduction. I'm at the age now where introductions begin to sound like obituaries, so I'll bear that in mind. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, uh, there's a, a little known office, at least for someone who wants to have published, uh, the Office of the Security Review, and uh, Paul Jacobs Meyer and his great folks were actually the first people to read my book outside of my circle of friends, and I really appreciate what they did, and they actually gave me some encouragement that they kind of liked the book too, so I'll try to see if I can swing by their office to talk to those guys as well. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to open by reading a couple of paragraphs from the book. And then I'm going to tell two stories that were related to this building. And then we'll do Q&A because the Q&A is much more fun. Now, in an audience like this, I realize you know how all war stories begin, right? All, story, all war stories begin with, there I was. And the response is, there you were. So... There I was. <laughs> All war stories begin with that phrase or some variation of it. My purpose in writing my book is to tell my war story and to take on the common narrative told about the Iraq war, which is the army did not plan on how to conclude the war. Though some American general officers have stated this case, it is simply untrue. I know it is not true because in 2002 and 2003, I was assigned to Third Army and responsible for directing the development of the plans for the invasion of Iraq. I went to war for the only time in my career as a staff colonel. In my first experiences of war, I was guided by my education, 
institutional and personal, as well as the experiences I had up to that point I gained in my professional career. My professional education included, introduced me to military theory, international relations theory, critical thinking, and familiarized me with alternative perspectives on deterrence. I was now about to enter a new level of planning as I was going to be the planner for a field army. And it would not, and it would be more than a field army a la World War II. I would be the operational level planner, writing directions for two core formations whose objective was the defeat of an opposing army and associated irregular troops, all of which would lead to the replacement of a regime. I felt I was ready for the challenge. I was a SAMS guy, so I would figure it out. In a theoretical world, planning proceeds in parallel with higher level headquarters, as well as in collaboration with subordinate headquarters. The planning for what would become Operation Iraqi Freedom did not take place in a theoretical world, which is an understatement. I confirmed for myself at least that the Prussian philosopher of war, Karl von Clausewitz, was correct. War is a continuation of policy by other means. True planning at the level I served at takes place in the space between military and policy requirements. My challenge was to sustain the energy required to complete a total major operations plan supporting the CENTCOM campaign plan while dealing with the demands of policy and policymakers from above and commanders and staffs below our headquarters. These demands from policymakers came in the form of email, phone calls and the famous Rumsfeld snowflakes. Secretary Rumsfeld sent numerous memos to the Joint Staff in Washington and the Central Command Headquarters. These contained questions and comments, all requiring immediate replies and came out of the Secretary's office so frequently they were termed snowflakes. The situation was best summed up by my SAMS classmate and good friend, then Colonel, he was a Brigadier General Select at the time, Vince Brooks. Colonel Brooks wrote me on 19 July 2002 saying, there was great impatience in Washington and we'd be asked to do things on the cheap, quote, well beyond the scope of military logic, end quote. So, two stories related to this building that uh, I, I hope will sort of whet your appetite for what I tried to include in the book. The, as I was telling my escort, Scott, that this is actually the seventh time today that I've been in this building. I successfully avoided serving here for 30 years, but I was a visitor. Uh, in September of 02, uh, the chief, General Shinseki, asked my boss, General McKiernan, to come up and brief the Army staff on our plan. And so I came along with General McKiernan and Terry Moran, who was the general's initiatives group fellow. Uh, we went to a room in this building. I tell you, I could not find it today. All I remember is there was a big picture of John Pershing in it, and it was a big enough room to contain all the staff principals of the Army staff, uh, four-star generals uh, in the Army, Materiel Command, TRADOC, Force Com. Let me see. Uh, key major generals who were deputies, uh, division commanders, and the corps, stateside corps commanders, the chief and the vice. Terry Moran was Mr. Outside. He was going to be outside taking notes. I was Mr. Inside in the very narrow closet where the audio visual stuff and computers were set up. So I was flipping the slides. And what I remember is it when it began, it being the, the presentation, General Shinseki turned to the audience and said, gentlemen, we are not here to grade Dave's work, General McKiernan. We're here to understand his plan and how we can best support it. Dave, and that's how we started. And I'm flipping slides, trying to listen, what's going on. And about 40 minutes in, General Shinseki says, Dave, that's been 40 minutes, let's take a break. So I listened to the scraping of the chairs, everybody standing up. Now, this room really was narrow. There was, a, there was a door and there was another door along the bank of computers. And I was in a, a chair on wheels. So I, I turned after I froze the charts and I started to get up and the door swings open and the doorknob smacks me right in the middle of the forehead and knocks me on my butt. And I'm seeing stars and as I 
come to focus, I look up and there's General Keene, the vice. And he's looking down at me and he says, Benson, who told you you could take a break? Get off your ass. And he chuckled and walked, stepped across my legs and walked into what I can only guess might have been the anteroom to the chief staff's office or something, I'm not sure. General Shinseki was right behind him. General Shinseki looked down at me, kind of concerned look on his face, didn't say anything, just smiled and, and walked through. And, and that was my inauspicious introduction to the senior leaders of our army. Uh, what a great way to start. The next story, again, involving this building. On the 25th of March, 2003, so shortly after we crossed the line of departure, uh, I had the great privilege, and that's sarcasm, of attending the Pentagon uh, secure VTCs. So I was in Kuwait in mop gear, chemical protective suit, sorry. There's a station here in the Pentagon. There's one at Tampa and one in Qatar where the CENTCOM headquarters was. And so I'm taking notes. The secretary is there. The chairman is there. There's an update from Central Command on the status of the fight at that time. And I'm just taking notes. The secretary says, thanks very much. He leaves, the chairman leaves, some of the other folks around the table leave. And Undersecretary Douglas Fife takes his place, takes the place at the head of the table. And General Abizé, who's in, in the temp, in the, excuse me, in the CENTCOM headquarters forward, begins a discussion on how we were going to deal with the BAF party. And it's something that I'd heard before because we'd incorporated that in how we were planning to conclude uh, the operation, white phase four as it was. And as General Abizé finished his talk, I watched is the undersecretary, Mr. Fife, who's sort of getting red in the face. And if I may, this is what he said. The policy of the United States government is de -bothification. There was silence. And I, I like to brag that in the only courageous act I did during that war, I hit the button on the secure VTC. So, you know, all of us have been in one of those and all the cameras come on you. So I'm sitting there in my battle rattle in my chemical gear. And I said, Mr. Secretary, excuse me, I'd, I'm Kevin Benson. I'm the, the C Flick C5. I really need some clarification on that because an obsade hit the override button and said, Kevin, I've got that. Get off. <laughs> okay. But no one ever got back to me. I reported that to my chain of command. That I don't know what's coming, but this is what I heard. And I said, yeah, yeah, let, let, we'll deal with that after we get to Baghdad. You can deal with it now. You're the planner. Okay. So those are two examples of stories that of encounters and events that took place in that amazing year that I was a planner. And I tried to put that into this book and to try to tell a good story. I do have some you know, final thoughts in it uh, that are the result of thinking about this for a long time. But I hope that that little short opening has whet your appetite a little bit so that I can entertain your questions. But thank you again for coming. I really appreciate it. Oh, and if you're interested, uh, you can get this uh, on Amazon. It isn't everything on Amazon. Uh, through Barnes & Noble or Casemate Publishing is the publisher of the book. So I'd be happy to take your questions if you have any. Because otherwise I can tell stories for a long time. Thanks. Um, uh, hear me okay? Yes, sir. Uh, Pat Antonetti, fellow West Corner class of 86, and was on the team with Asper and Mike. <laughs> uh, 
but uh, now we have a plan and a plan. Very good. But my question is what you would propose as planning about phase four? Was that all done under the Pentagon? When General Garner and the folks at Orha arrived, I was one of the happiest guys around uh, because we really were deep in planning our phase four. Our first plan was called, uh, excuse me, our first plan was called Cobra II. And we included a phase four in Cobra II because I am well, I was educated at the School of Advanced Military Studies. That's the totality of a campaign plan. You include all the way to phase four. Uh, and it was getting more and more complex. General Garner, as I recall, arrived sometime in February, which was about the time that I realized I had to write an entirely different plan for phase four. It was going to be a sequel as opposed to a continuation of Cobra II, but that's another story. When General Garner arrived there, uh, I was one of the, I had the privilege of being one of the first folks to brief him. You know, open arms, you know, General, come on in. Here's the totality of what we're working on. This is what we think is going to happen. This, this is the results of our war game. And he was gracious enough, you know, what a, what a tremendous officer uh, to you know, keep me informed too. And not just me, of course, he's talking to General McKiernan and our chief of staff, General Blackman, but you know, things were, it was really close. Uh, I could also sense though, that there was frustration. One of the things that I just vividly remember is after I went down to, we didn't have room for him at what we called Camp Doha, the medium security prison where we were living. Uh, he was in a hotel along the beach just south of the main part of Kuwait City. Uh, and it was a secured facility and, and all that. But I went down there and after a presentation, we were talking about dividing Iraq into zones of control for appointed officials, this is before coalition provisional authority. Uh, there was just, you know how sometimes you can sense in a room that there's just frustration. And at a break, I went to him and I said, you know, hey, sir, is there something I can do? I mean, I just don't know what's, I've got to sense things, you're not real happy. And he said, Kevin, let me show you something. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a piece of paper. He unfolded it uh, and it was White House stationery. And it was handwritten, and it said that you know, all departments, agencies, organizations, words to that effect, uh, need to fully support Lieutenant General retired Jay Garner. And it was signed George W. Bush. And I thought, the president gave you a directive like this? You know, General, what, is, what could possibly be the problem? And he just sort of shrugged and said, no one pays attention. Wow. So we had a, for planners, we were really tight. I, I talked to the guys that were acting as his planners a lot. Because in the structure of, the way I envisioned the structure of the campaign plan unfolding, you know, CENTCOM had phase one through phase four, and CFLIC, our phase four was going to be phase 4A of the CENTCOM plan. And there was going to be a transition. And the transition was going to unfold to our headquarters, to some other military headquarters. And then that end state of phase 4B was the handover of military control to civil control. And at some point in phase 4C, that was going to go from some US ambassador extraordinaire or something like that to the Iraqi government. So I was working really close, not just me, me and the officers who worked for me, my phase 14 with Orha to con develop the conditions, what we saw would be the end state conditions for phase 4A, which would be the starting conditions for phase 4B when Orha would really be ramping up. 
and we tried to make sure they knew, understand everything about what we were looking at for phase 4A. Uh, now, did any of that come to pass? Well, no, but that's another story. But I hope that answered your question. I, I tried to do it as closely as I could. because you know, General, General Garner, I thought, really got the short end of the stick. Uh, and then there was a, another Lieutenant General, Ron Adams, who I'd had the privilege of serving with before when he was a Lieutenant Colonel and I was a Captain. He was a, an aviator. Uh, and General Adams is a good man too. And I just really had the, the gut feel that they got the slimy end of the stick and I wasn't gonna let them be out there flapping by themselves. But thank you for that question, sir. General, uh, Mr. Walt Slocum. Oh, thank you for that one. I'd, I'd never met Mr. Slocum. I, I got a heads up that Mr. Slocum was coming in. His role was going to be the uh, representative of coalitional, coalition provisional authority at the newly reconstituted or soon to be reconstituted whenever Iraqi Ministry of Defense. And he arrived at, at Camp Doha for a presentation uh, and, and so we rolled it out for him, laid out, here's, you know, the current status, this is what's going on. And then, uh, you know, Colonel Benson, the J-5, is going to talk to you about how we're transitioning. And so I, I stood up and I, I talked to him about Eclipse 2, which is the name of our Phase 4 plan. But I would have really wanted to drive across Mr. Slocum was that we did not assume that we could recall the Iraqi army. We did not assume we could recall the Iraqi bureaucracy. We really took those as facts because in our preliminary research, we were told, and I heard this from a number of folks, you know, academicians and, and you know, experienced folks who I promised I would never say their name, so I never will, uh, saying that there are two institutions in Iraq that predate the Ba'ath Party. The army was established by the British after World War I, and the bureaucracy, also established by the British after World War I, when they were controlling the country, and appeal to them and they'll come back. So a point I stressed to Mr. Slocum was that at the time, oh, I should have anticipated this question. This was in, I want to say, April, late April of 2003. I stressed to Mr. Slocum that General McKiernan was, in, in fact, in talks with Iraqi general officers who were telling us they could bring their troops back, and that I had officers and, and NCOs who were out doing surveys of what we knew to be Iraqi installations, bombed as they were, uh, and looted, frankly, that would have a reasonable chance of being re, you know, reconstituted so there would be an assembly point. And I Point blank, I, mean, I looked him in the eyes. Mr. Slocum, I just want to know, are we still acting in accord with policy? And he looked at me and he said, thanks for the briefing, Colonel. And I said, excuse me, Mr. Slocum, perhaps I wasn't clear. Are we still acting in accord with policy? He goes, no, I got it. Thanks for the briefing, Colonel. Anything more, Dave? It's the General McKiernan, and then they got up and left. And I know this is being recorded, so I won't say all the barracks language that I used, but afterwards, my 
my planners who were also in the room came up to me and they said, Colonel B, what was that? And I said, it beats me. And I sort of, that was not my first indicator, but my one of the many indicators that any plan that I had made was sort of be quick, swiftly becoming overcome by events. But I hope that answers your question, sir. It was interesting talking to Mr. Slocum. That was the only time I ever had the chance to talk to him. I do not know the answer to that question. I really don't. I, I've tried to, frankly, I've pursued that. Whose idea was it? I have no idea. I truly don't. And I've, I mean, I've, I've read uh, transcripts of oral history interviews by all of these folks from universe, held at University of Virginia. Uh, I've read, I read Doug Fife's book. I've read Ambassador Bremer's book. I've read Secretary Rumsfeld, one of the books Secretary Rumsfeld did. I have no idea. I truly don't. Yes, sir. This is the question I've been waiting for. Lieutenant General retired Jim Dubick, who was my my monograph director when I was a, when I was a major. Sir, sir. Could you uh, I'd like to frame the statement. And the other Thank you, sir. Boy, did it. If, if, for context, you know, what we saw in Afghanistan that preceded Iraq was, you know, some very brave special forces guys on horseback charging along and bombs being rained down upon the Taliban from invulnerable altitudes and everything vanished and there was victory. I think that I truly think there was the expectation of shock and awe that the same thing was going to happen. Uh, for example, when I arrived at our headquarters, Fort McPherson, Georgia, I asked, the first question I asked my planners was, who's working on what we're going to do after we get to Baghdad? And my lead planner at the time he had sandbags under his eyes from working continuously since September 11th of the previous year. I said, uh, boss, we're not working on that. I, really? What are we working on? And he handed me a Xerox of a buck slip. I'm not making this up. That said, we have a brigade on the ground, period. Why can't we go now? Question mark. Signed Wolfowitz. And my first, again, I'm not making this up. My first response was to laugh because I thought this is a prime example of planner humor. That I'm the new guy. They, these folks don't know me. And yet they've got the moxie to bust my chops on day one. That I love this outfit. And so I laughed and I said, <laughs> okay, Tom, that's really funny, but no, really, seriously, I, I, I am the Colonel. So what are we working on really? And he just sadly shook his head and said, boss, that is what we're working on right now. Answering the deputy secretary's question. So, sir, I think there was an expectation that we could do a lot with a lot fewer forces and 
ordnance coming from invulnerable altitudes shattering anything that we saw. I think that also had a play on how we were going to reorganize ourselves institutionally and and come across as, you know, what does a warfighter mean? Now, well, then you know, because you were one of my teachers. Uh, my approach was the totality of a campaign plan is phase one through phase last. And phase last is, the conclusion of phase last is coming back to the motor pool and putting parts on order, but attaining policy objectives, military conditions to allow policymakers to say we've accomplished our policy objectives. Uh, I, I really believe that the expectation was we've got a brigade in the ground. Let's go now. Uh, and so the first big fight, if you will, was convincing the policymakers in this building or the one across the street, pardon me, uh, that, okay, but we need to have a sufficient sized force on the ground before we take the decision to go to war. Uh, because the way we answered that question, and, and again, this sounds pedantic, but the way we answered the question was we went back to the, the staff officer's guide that I got when I was a, a student at staff college. And we made the calculations of how much food, fuel, ammo, water uh, would it take to move one tank with a four, a four man crew from Udari range to Baghdad. You know, that's 600 plus kilometers and have them move against, we just assumed light resistance. And then we calculated the tonnage of supplies that it would need to say, okay, look, the brigade in the ground has nowhere near the trucks to move the stuff that we needed. Now, it might've come across as cheeky. I really don't know what happened to that because we packaged it at Third Army. And of course it went to Central Command and, you know, I'm sure that somebody changed it at Central Command because you know, Benson is crossing the line here. You know, somebody hit, go hit him. And then it went to the Joint Staff, and I'm sure the Joint Staff modified it too. But that's the, the struggle, not fight, struggle that we were in, was to build the case that we had to have the complete combined arms team of at the time combat, combat support and combat service support forces to be able to sustain ourselves. So that I think that was the tension. My, my great friend, and he really is a good friend of mine, Doug McGregor was a you key know, of breaking the phalanx, that book. Uh, I know that he had presented a plan, a series of PowerPoint charts that showed how one brigade coming out of Kuwait, one brigade coming out of Jordan could completely knock the devil out of the entire Iraqi army and then be back in the States in time for the, the great victory parade. Uh, and I know that took, that played into the expectation, I think of, you know, the, the what was it called? The revolution in military affairs folks that thought we could do a lot with less. That, and again, sir, forgive me for being long-winded, but that carried over to, as I'm sure a lot of you know, that there's a great deal of effort that goes into developing the time phase force deployment list. But we all gathered at Transcom headquarters at Scott Air Force Base and you know, plugged the numbers of cube and weight and tonnage and how many ships does it take to move a tank division how many airplanes does it need to take the folks to coordinate the time for link up, all of that stuff. And when we had a, a transportation feasible time phase force deployment list, hooray, high fives all around. And then Secretary Rumsfeld said, we're not going to do that. And he wanted to meter the flow. So we had to break it up and make requests for forces. So if we wanted the fourth division to come, we had to build that package, submit it all the way from the chain, up the chain of command to the secretary. And then the struggle there was, 
justifying well. 40,000 troops. Why do you need 40,000? And then the exchange I had was to one of the guys working in his office. Is there, all right, you know, blast it. Tell me what the force cap is. And there was this sucking of teeth. No, oh, there's no force cap, Kevin. Don't ever say that word. Okay. Then tell me how many I can have. Well, I don't know, but you have to figure it out. So that's what we were faced with. And I think that was part of the tension. In every single unit that we asked for that had been apportioned in the war plan, we had to go through that process of developing what it would look like, when it would get there near the early and late arrival dates, all of that stuff, and then what it would do after we got there. Because, you know, again, the expectation was the fighting will be over by the time the 4th Division gets there. Why do you need the 4th? Why do you need 1st Armored Division? If the British send a, a British Armored Division, why do you need the 1st Cavalry Division? Well, because the Brit division is a name, name only, but you know we can't get into that. So, sir, I'm sorry, long-winded, but that—that's that—that's yeah, it was real. I felt it every day, uh, you know, trying to get the right what we thought was the right number of folks with the right skills to complete. Again, I, I sound pedantic when I say this, but to establish the military conditions that we felt would lead to say we attained these, the policy objectives are, you know, Mr. Secretary, you can say we won. It was a struggle. It really was. Hi there, sir. Um, Adam Klein, Lieutenant Commander with uh, OpNav uh, N95. I'm an engineer. Um, you mentioned that there was a closing strategy uh, at, at the outset. What were some of the main variables that caused it to need to be changed? And at one point, at what point did it become clear that it was just going to be no longer viable? Well, thank you, Commander. I appreciate that. I got a great Navy story for you later on. Uh, the uh, in the middle of Fe and forgive me, this could be kind of a shaggy dog story. In the middle of February. My boss wanted to have a rock drill on a big uh, terrain model of Kuwait and Iraq up to Turkey, Iran, and all that, and where the, the commanding generals of the corps and the divisions would get on it and walk, talk about what they were going to do. It was really incredible. Uh, but it was only through phase three major combat operations. Excuse me, I was still working on phase four. We transitioned the plan from the, the five to the three. And my role was to continue to refine the plan and, and finish phase four. So what we'd projected for the phase four, the time was on all the charts. And you can find these charts, the uh, Army War College, uh, Got all this stuff declassified. It's on the Army Army Historical. I darn it, I can't remember the name of the organization. There's an organization, the Carlisle Barracks, where you can actually see all these charts. The chart I'm talking about had phase four and had a question mark at the end. I personally thought it was going to take three to five years to attain what we felt we needed to be, needed to be done. To wit, uh, the Emergency repair of critical infrastructure. As try as we might with the, the, the campaign plan or the bombing uh, support, you know, there were still bridges that were struck. There were still power lines that were down. And we felt we had to get these things back up, at least to the point where NGOs and private volunteer organizations and just contractors could come in and pick it up and complete the restoration. Uh, there were still damage to oil fields, even though we didn't want to. Uh, those were some of the key points that we raised. Also was, well, again, we thought we could recall the regular army, not the Republican Guard, not the special Republican Guard, 
the regular army and the process of vetting all of those troops and their leaders. That was another milestone that we were working on. How long do we think it's going to take to do that? Uh, again, to make sure that they're loyal to the government of Iraq. There were other pieces, the military role in supporting, uh, again, it was General Garner at the time in Orha, the Organization for Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance. Uh, I think that was right. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Orha folks, and, and they were to rebuild or restore the, uh, the civilian part of the Iraqi government, all of those ministries. We had Army Corps of Engineers, there were CBs over there, uh, you know, Air Force Red Horse Engineers, who were engaged, or we anticipated would be engaged in, again, the restoration of, or, or the re emergency repair of critical infrastructure. All of those things were things we were articulating. Uh, and then, Mr. Slocum, am I still acting in accord with policy? Thanks for the briefing, Colonel. Uh, 25 March, debothifications of policy of the United States government, uh, kind of indicators of, holy cow, where are we going? And then Ambassador Bremer showed up and issued his first two orders, one of which was, if you're ever a member of the Ba'ath Party, you can't be a member of the government. And the second was, the Iraqi army is disbanded, period. We're starting over. Uh, and you know, that was, it was sort of in plain writing there. It was like, well, Benson, what you've been doing, not worth a tinker's darn. Uh, that I, I'm really, it was, it, it sounds funny, but I was eating Pepsi AC like candy. I really was. And I was eating Pepsi AC like candy for about six months after I got back to the States. I'm serious. It really upset me what we were doing. I hope that answers your question. But again, it's war is an extension of policy through other means. And we have to be agile enough and intellectually flexible enough that when policy changes, we have to keep up with it. And I think we are morally obligated to tell folks not so much what, what force can do, but what it cannot do. Now, I, I, again, I, in one of my more cheeky moments, I even, I don't even remember who it was, but it was some guy on the other end of the, of the VTC in DC uh, in this building. And, and he was talking about, you know, well, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. And, and I, I said, you know, that Talleyrand told Napoleon, there's many things you can do with a bayonet, but you can't sit on it. I don't think he understood what I was saying. Ladies first, Rocky. Hi, sir. Heidi Shirley. Um, really appreciate your perspective and your and your land power expertise and, and the policy stories. But wondering, do you have any um, vignettes about joint integration or joint challenges or support to other services that affected you at the CSIC level? Absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. Here again is another one of my favorite stories as a lead into joint integration. My very first. Uh, Component Commanders Conference. Shortly after I arrived, I went with our, was our commander at the time, Lieutenant General P.T. Michlashek. And General Michlashek took me down to Tampa and we went into the big conference room. All the component commanders were there uh, and General Franks walked in. Well, I, I love Tom Franks. I really, I'd worked with him a couple of times. And he's, you know, slapping backs and, and telling all sorts of stuff. And we're talking about, we're taking, really amazing decisions about what's going to happen. And when they took a break, my boss leaned over to talk to, oh God, I just spaced his name. He was, he became the Air Force Chief of Staff. Oh. No, it wasn't, he, he'd be, he was the ninth Air Force Commander at the time. Why have I spaced his name? Anyway, he leaned over to the ninth Air Force Commander, Buzz Moses. 
General Mosley. And he handed him a piece of paper. I didn't. You know, I'm taking notes. I'm getting ready to talk to the, the air planners to introduce myself. And I watched, you know, General Mosley, he's follically challenged like I am. And, and I watched the red from the base of his neck go all the way over the top of his head. And he turned around and had these big eyes and he fixed them on me and just gave the paper to his planner. He said, look at this malarkey from Seaflick. And all the air guys were getting together and, it, and every once in a while a head would pop up and go, God damn army. And then go back down and it's like, okay, uh, now I gotta know what's going on. And so I walked over and I said, hey, what's up? And my counterpart, Al Wickman, Al goes, so tell me what your qualifications are on air planning. And I said, wow, what are you talking about? And he said, look at this crap. And he hands me this paper. And I read it, and it's from our J3, who at the time was Colonel Mike Haverlack, directly to our commanding general, Lieutenant General Mike Lachet. And Benson wasn't on the address line at all. And Mike had been at Central Command and had been in the Ops Center and you know, done um, Northern and Southern Watch and had been involved. You know, I, I'm getting to you know, joint, jointness, things you had to overcome. And so I, I looked at this paper and it was, I mean, this is pretty cheeky from Army guys. We were just like, we're going to control every bloody plane that flies into the Army zone. And, and I said, hey, and I said, Haverlack, Mike Leshek, and then I pointed to my name tag, B-E-N-S-O-N. -N. And then we made a deal that my boss, they're going to replace us, but hey, we're planners, we're in this together. I'm never going to let you guys be surprised, we shook hands. And of course, our, our Navy and Marine Corps brothers and sisters kind of wandered over because they loved watching the intramural firefights. And so everybody's laughing uh, by that. And then I, I turned around and ran right into General Mosley. And he was still kind of outraged. And he looks at me and starts poking me in the chest. Who do you think you are? A blankety blank army son of a. And I said, General Averlack, Mike Leshek, B E N S O. And then he laughed, said, okay, Benson, you're all right, but don't you ever get in my way. <laughs> joint plan and joint, especially the, you know, the Title 10, Army Support for Other Services, took a lot of time. And it was the right things to do, not only with you know, the, the five at CFLIC, but the four as well. I mean, we were all us planners were together, and so how do we how do we get all the fuel that the Air Force needs at the air bases in Kuwait? You know, the ones in, in Qatar and in Saudi weren't our concern, at least not Third Army directly, because those were contracts already set up. But in Kuwait, so how do we do that? Uh, the establishment of pipelines so that as we establish bases further in, taking over Iraqi air bases, and could fly A-10s, at least that was the thought. So the pipelines that the Army's gonna put in to sustain fuel, Graves registration for both the Corps, uh, the, the first MEF and, and five Corps, uh, damned important, making sure that's all set up. Mail, same thing. All of those were pieces that we had to consider in the, and not so much in the base plan, but in the detailed annexes that were a part of the development of the plan. We spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, and, it, and it was, you know, it, it's, it's worth it. I mean, that's, that's the real work of being a planner, I thought, and that, that's the way I kind of coached my folks, is this is stuff, we, if we don't do this, no one's gonna do it. And people are gonna wonder, well, where the hell is my mail? Where's Chow? Buddy just took one in the head. How are we going to get him out of here? Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the establishment of the hospitals. Man, boy, I'll tell you, class eight. And you know, the Army Medical Department, the Navy Medics, the Air Force. Uh, there was a 
I don't know if it was the mercy or the comfort, but we had a hospital ship out there too. Uh, and, and all of those considerations had to be factored in. Because then we went back into the, the planner's guide of what's the expectation of casualties as divisions move forward against light to maybe moderate resistance. Because there's tables, you know that, that show us how many casualties we can expect to a level of fighting, which means how, you know, I'm, I'm preaching the choir, how much class A do we have to move, how much evac do we have to have. What, and then the, we could trust the medics to go, okay, you know, what's the surgical capability on board the Mercy or the Comfort? So you know, we'll, who has to be diverted there? What can we do in the MASH and the CASH and all that? I mean, all of that detailed planning was a part of the effort. And it was joint. It really was. Uh, there were, right until we crossed the LD, I had uh, marine planners from the MEF who were sitting down with us every day, lived with us at, at Camp Doha. The Navy guys would come in, you know, shuttle in. I don't remember what ship they were on, but they would shuttle in uh, to talk about the clearance of the, the seaway up to the port of Basra. And where was the army going to, what was the army going to do? It was the Navy's responsibility. Uh, that's the, later on, Commander, I'll tell you, there, there's the funny story about, about Navy planning and tip fiddles and all that kind of stuff. You'll, you'll get a kick out of it. Uh, but it was a big, big part. And, and, and again, I, I, forgive me for being long-winded. Um, I sensed that, boy, we don't educate our people well enough on this. to really get down into the details. And I'm not just talking Army folks. I mean, some of the stuff we were talking about was a surprise to, to Navy planners. Not, not so much the Marine Corps planners, but I mean, there were even some surprises there uh, because we also had to ship a bunch of, no pun intended, there, there was Army uh, in direct support and attached to the MEF, you know, the long shooters, the ATACs, uh, and the MLRS reinforcing fires, and then the sustainment of those. All of that was intermeshed, it really was. It was really, it was the most complex war game I ever did. And the joint part of it, I'm happy to say, and I really mean this, outside of you know the, the, the intramural firefights uh, that we would have that were kind of entertaining uh, to a certain extent, it really was, it wasn't even a, an afterthought. It's, this is what we've got to do. My, my buddy Al, uh, the, the, the uh, A5, his son is a rifle platoon commander in the MEF. And you damn well know he was concerned about making sure there was enough air power supporting the Corps over and above the wing. I mean, it, it, it was it became really personal and to do it right. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. And I'm, and I'm a tanker. So, you know, you can't go anywhere without beans, bullets, and benzene. Rocky. Sure. Uh, maybe to add some perspective, the, after I left New England, the role kind of there, um, announcement <clears throat> Ambassador Bremer's order was, the expectation of all the planners out in Pittsburgh and down of sound blast up of the Iraqi army. As you mentioned, we've been working at the core with contact in assessing the viability of many of the senior regular army officers. So that wasn't just a perception of that, that was about the entire uh, entirety. like to offer one of uh, as we were working on occupation production I think our success in combat operations actually reconstruction perception of the Iraqi military and populace was that well we did such a phenomenal job military operation production reconstruction was in a At least from that perspective. 
Yeah. Well, the one thing I heard was that Americans put a man on the moon. Surely they can. If I don't have power at my house, it means they don't want me to have power. Dave Lau, the LeMay Center Air Force Doctrine. Sir, what's your favorite story from the book that we haven't asked you about yet? <laughs> Truly, my favorite story that's in the book uh, involves far too much Erky Barracks language for me to tell. Here, it's something that's better told over adult beverages in a bar. Um, okay. My second favorite one was, you know, I was an armor officer and I'd been in cavalry units. So in my mind, I'd envisioned crossing the line of departure in my panzer, leading my soldiers. And you know, I said, I went to war as a staff colonel. Uh, and so the first time I crossed into enemy territory, crossed that line of departure, I was in a rented car driven by a British major. And we drove into Basra to witness the, the turning on of a water pipe that the Kuwaitis had built to deliver water to the Iraqis in Basra. And I just thought, my God, at least the car was a Lancer. So it had you know, some military sort of thing. So that, that, that really is. I just thought, God, this just sums up my whole, you know, whole thing. Never got shot at except by missiles, which you know, who cares? Thanks. I'll be happy to tell you the other one, but it really is kind of earthy in barracks language. I apologize. Thank you all very much. I see it's like two minutes till one. I can recommend three other books. The Achilles Trap by a guy named Stephen C-O-L-L. -L. I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. It's about the intelligence prep for this war and actually started before the first Gulf War. Uh, Professor uh, Mel Leffler's book, Confronting Saddam Hussein, and then Dr. Mike Mazar's book, Leap of Faith. Uh, when I read those three books, and I, I write in the margins of my books, I found myself cursing, saying, why didn't they tell us this? Or they're really good, based on Freedom of Information Act, inquiries and the fact that all this stuff's been declassified now since it's been over 20 years. Again, thank you very much for sharing your time with me. I hope I entertained you and that you got something out of this. Thank you again for allowing me this privilege. And thanks, everybody.